Hey there, fourth trimester listeners. Our program today is proudly sponsored by Family Album, your secure haven for sharing baby photos and videos. Head over to the App Store today, search Family Album, one word, download the app, and start creating a legacy of love, one photo at a time. Hi, I'm Sarah Trott, and welcome to the Fourth Trimester Podcast. I'm a new mama, and this podcast is all about postpartum care for the first few months following birth, the time period also known as the Fourth Trimester. My postpartum doula, Esther Gallagher, is my co-host. She's a mother, grandmother, perinatal educator, birth and postpartum care provider. Fourth Trimester Care, our topic, is about the practical, emotional, and social support parents and baby require. And importantly, it helps set the tone for the continuing journey of parenting. Hi, this is Sarah Trapp. Welcome back to the Fourth Trimester Podcast. I have a special guest today with me. Her name is Rebecca Walsh, and I'll introduce her in a moment. I'd like to remind everyone that we have a website, which is fourthtrimesterpodcast.com. So please visit and sign up for our newsletter so you can be reminded every time we have a new episode. We share lots of great content there. You can also hit subscribe on Apple iTunes podcasts or wherever you listen to your shows so that you can hear from us whenever we have a new release. So Rebecca Walsh, thank you for joining us today. Hello. Hello. So good to be here. So good to have you. Today's topic is a really cool one. We're talking about mom groups, first time mom groups, second time mom groups. And I will say that I benefited hugely from participating in your second time mm-hmm. mom's group mm-hmm. there. It was just such a cool experience for me. And so I've wanted you on the show for a while. Yay. I'm so happy we're doing this. Yeah. So just for your intro here. So you are a female founder, which I love. You founded your business Early Childhood Matters in 2009, and you did that after becoming a parent and really kind of being in that toddler mode firsthand (laughs) with your toddler. So we'll talk more about that. But you've been creating and leading education programs for first-time mom groups and second-plus time mom groups for some time, and you also offer private consultations. You have over 20 years experience in early childhood education. You have a bachelor's degree in child development. You have a master's degree as well in religion and psychology, and you've also founded and taught at various preschools, including a homeless program, which I really admire, and you are an up-and-coming author, so I'm excited for you about that. (laughs) Yes. Yeah, yeah. And just on a personal note, yeah, what I would say I love about your style of working with parents uh, is that you're incredibly focused on teaching and modeling self-compassion mm. in parenting. Yes. So I, I just want to say thank you for that. And I, I so appreciate what you've done for me. And you, I also appreciate that you're so highly qualified, but also incredibly humble about Aww. that. Thank you. Yes. Well, parenting was one of the most humbling journeys that we can ever go on as humans. And, you know, definitely for me, having a couple of degrees and, you know, almost 20 years experience working with other people's children before I had my own, you know, I thought at least I have some kind of advantage, right? (laughs) But when, you know, certainly when my son became a toddler, I was immediately humbled. And just, I think the compassion that you develop for other parents in that moment when you see firsthand like, oh, this is a 24 hour job. This is not, you know, an eight hour job. This is, this is not one tantrum a day. This is the intensity of, of everything and just needing that support for like, I needed that support, right? Like (laughs) I needed encouragement. I needed a community. I needed advice, right? Like I needed to reread all my books, like all of them. (laughs) (laughs) so um so yeah it's a it's a it's a humbling experience and the longer I teach parenting classes the more I also realize so much of being the best version of ourselves as parents is about how much we are caring for ourselves and when you know how do we show up for our kids if we are not taking that time to really nourish ourselves and be ourselves, be human. And then we make so many mistakes. And so the the more mistakes we make, you know, the more we realize that we are just, we're all on this journey and we're all just, you know, 
doing the very best that we can. And that's full of lots of la, 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 la. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> So much there. And so you were doing this for so much time and then you became a parent yourself. Right. When I, like I said, when my son became a toddler, I think, and I realized we were on like the 10th tantrum of the day. I, (laughs) I realized, oh, this is why it's so much harder because normally when I'm working with other people's tantrum, other, other people's tantrums (laughs) of their children, um, I get like maybe one or two of their tantrums. And so I kind of have, you know, you have this capacity to hold your ground, to be, you know, to be calm, to be firm, to be loving, to be kind. And then when you're at home and it's like the 20th, tantrum of the day, that's when um, you realize, oh, this is why parents give in to tantrums. I mean, it sounds ridiculous, but I really, as a teacher, I never understood why a parent would ever give in to a tantrum. I was like, well, obviously, if you give in, it's going to, you know, reward that behavior. Like, why would anybody do that? <laughs> and then, <laughs> you know, then you have your own and you realize, oh, it's, it's, again, it's tantrum number 30 that you give into. And that's only been, you know, um, in, in the course of 24 hours. Um, and yeah, just, just so humbled. Um, and like I said, I think for me at that moment, I had this aha moment, like if it's this hard for me, then I really need to at least, but at least I had all the strategies that I could cycle back through and I could remind myself of, and I could, I had the, I knew which books to read, right? Like, and now of course it's like, who do you follow on Instagram and all of that? But like, I knew what resources would be incredibly valuable and incredibly helpful. I had mentors in my head. I had people that I could almost like a video rewind and watch them in my mind and say, what would they do in this situation? What would they tell me right now? And I knew that the average parent just didn't have all of those resources. You know, the internet is full of information and you get very overwhelmed and confused. Um, But I knew, so I knew exactly which which research I wanted to look at in that moment. I Mm -hmm. knew what I wanted to review. I knew the mentors in my head that I could replay what they would do, what they would say. And so it was helpful to me. Like all of that was really helpful. And I had this aha moment, like, okay, I, if this is this hard for me and here your average parent who doesn't have all those resources and ideas and mentors to fall back on, like how hard is it for, like, how is anybody doing this? Like, how are any of these children? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But, um, but it just was like, I've got to at least start sharing, you know, what do I know? And all of our workshops have always started with like, the developmental piece. Like, what do we know about the child development? What do we know about how their brain works? Um, I always start with there because that's like, that was the most helpful for me to fall back on. And then what are tried and true strategies with each age group, right? And I know most of your listeners are really in that fourth trimester, right? And in those early days, although some of your listeners might have a second child in that in that time as well. Yeah, we do have a lot of listeners going through the second time or maybe even third time where they're looking back and they're saying, gosh, I want to know more this time around yeah. or, you know, doing some deeper research uh, and, and looking for resources and a different kind of experience. In fact, we have an episode on the show dedicated to the second child transition, which is episode 79 for anyone who's interested to go back and listen to that one. And I recorded that shortly after having my second baby. Oh, <laughs> so it was highly relevant awesome. for me at that time. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that's so good. Yeah. Uh, which is brilliant. Well, I'll, I'll definitely be sharing that episode with all of the second time moms that I work with as well. <laughs> Yay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, um, and you had, it's like you were saying, it's so vivid. You had all these mentors and these people in mind are there books or mentors or and resources you would share since you mentioned yeah yeah definitely for yeah for which stage like for the early or for the the toddler or either any i have so much respect for you as, in this space i just would love to hear who you love and appreciate yeah i mean i definitely like magda gerber the rye method and then later janet lansbury who i think took her work and just made it really applicable Mm -hmm. i think you know that's that's a huge that was a huge resource for me but i there is a book called becoming the parent you want to be and it's janice kaiser and laura davis and 
I found this book when my son was becoming a toddler and what drew me to it was it was written by actually some local Bay Area early childhood experts that were they taught at the um, actually at Skyline College, which is a community college here in the Bay Area, and they were in the child development department. And that just reminded me so much of my mentors, right? Like, because I, I had the opportunity, I went to um, a university that had a lab school. And so I got to actually watch my instructors in college be preschool teachers. And that was an amazing oh. experience. I mean, yeah. these were people that were just the top of their field, right? And so I got to watch them. So these authors who are instructors in child development, they wrote this book together. And so that I love this book. And it's become I love the title too, becoming the parent you want to be right. Because I think a lot of what they talk about is this idea of how do we break cycles of maybe what was handed down to us. And you know, we all have those things in our minds when we become parents where we say, I'll never say that. I'll never do that. I'll never yell like my mom did. I'll never do this. I'll never do that. And then we find ourselves as parents and we're like, oh, I'm actually doing all of it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and and that's, I think that's really normal and that's really human. But the thing that, and maybe you remember me saying this to you, Sarah, but the thing that I try to do as a parent is to not then stop in that cycle where then you're like, oh, okay, I did that. Oh my gosh, I'm such a bad mom. I'm just like my mom. I can't believe, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I said that. Uh, And then what do you do? Then the next time it happens, you do the same thing. So what I like to, you know, do and what I like to share is this idea of when that happens, you forgive yourself, you just forgive yourself. And you say, Mm -hmm. you know what, that was a bad moment. That was a bad day. I was stressed. I was tired. I was exhausted, like whatever it is. And then um, you give yourself a little compassion. And then you say, okay, so I know my child is going to do this tomorrow, right? I know this is going to happen tomorrow. Maybe you're talking about a newborn. I know my newborn is going to be colicky and upset tomorrow. Like, what are my strategies? Who am I going to call for help? How do I do something differently than what I just did that I didn't love that I did? But like, Mm -hmm. instead of getting trapped in that cycle, trying to think, and that's where I said, that's how I tried to handle those moments as a parent was to say, oh, wow, this is really hard. And I really don't like the way I responded, but like, this is going to happen again like literally tomorrow. (laughs) And so what am I going to do? Like, what are my resources in my back pocket? What are my strategies? And so trying to, to use all those, but um, yeah, so we do have uh, our, you know, parenting through the toddler years courses online as well. Um, And so those are some other things, uh, resources, just so you can get more strategies, right? Like more things in your back pocket. But yeah, I, I would say those, I mean, Gosh, there's so many books, <laughs> um, <laughs> but but those for the early years, those were definitely some of my favorites. Thank you. I appreciate you sharing those. I'll link all of those onto our article on our website, fourthtrimesterpodcast.com, so people can go and find them too. Perfect. You know, what you're saying about self-forgiveness, it seems so important and people might, you know, I've gone through those cycles of like, oh, I said that, I can't believe I said that. Or like, you know, like yeah. those moments where you just realize, you know, what for whatever reason I've been there, you know, where I felt depleted and said or done something that wasn't my goal. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't the parent you want to be, right? Yep. Which by the way, I love that book. I think we have that link to our site and like our recommended books list. We've, oh, cool. It's, it's come up by so many people. It's so highly regarded. I love that you mentioned that oh, resource yay. in particular. Yeah, so good. And I've read it and I love it. And yeah, and so I'd be curious to know, do we give ourselves some credit though for even recognizing those moments? So it's not like these things happen and we continue. The fact that we're recognizing it is how to break that change, right? That's the whole point. A beautiful, beautifully said, Sarah. I mean, I, I, yes, 100%. And I think for most generations before us, there wasn't, in fact, parenting, like the word is actually very modern, just the idea of parenting, right? For most generations, you sort of just did what your parents did and you didn't really think, you didn't really do research on it, right? You didn't listen to podcasts. Um, you didn't really get many more ideas. And, you know, there were, there was also, you know, there were, there were different support systems that probably in some ways made that easier, like where you had you know, larger networks of support, right? And, you know, you had grandparents and uncles and aunts and older cousins and all of these, you know, 
But the reality is this idea of actually thinking about how do we want to parent, it's a very modern invention. And I think it's wonderful that we are bringing a level of intentionality now to our parenting. And I think that's what that's what our generation is doing, right? That's what's yeah. setting us apart is we're saying, okay, you know what? I don't necessarily just want to do everything that my parents did. And I want to think about how to maybe do something a little bit differently, how to be more intentional, how to respond a little bit differently. And I don't want to just pass down all of those generational patterns that maybe didn't serve me well as an adult right? Maybe didn't encourage me to be the best version of myself in some ways, right? I mean, I was lucky to have like a very loving mother and we take what is good and then we try to iterate upon that. I think that's, that's what I do. I, I always tell parents too, like what is Einstein's version of insanity is doing the same thing and over and over that's not working, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's where we get stuck as parents. Over and over, we do the same things that are not working. And so I love to help parents just think, think a little bit more broadly about what are some other things? Because when you're in the moment too, like it's really hard to think about anything else. (laughs) So that's why I say like, always like, wait, give yourself just some time. And then that night, you know, maybe listen to a podcast, maybe (laughs) uh, check out some resources, but then, you know, think about, okay, well, what am I going to do a little bit differently tomorrow? Yeah. But the, the other thing I have to share, as you brought that up, is the four stages of learning. Have you ever seen that? Let's talk about it. Okay. I love the four stages. It's, well, it's four stages of confidence, I guess. So I love this. And it's it's basically, it reminds like exactly what you're saying. So the first stage is called unconscious incompetence. And this is like ignorance is bliss, right? Mm-hmm. So we don't know that we're incompetent in something. We're just doing it incompetently, but we don't know that we're incompetent. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to us or we don't know any better. Ignorance is bliss. Okay. The next stage is conscious incompetence. And so this is where I think our generation of parents is where we're Mm -hmm. like, I am now aware that this way of parenting is not ideal, that this way of parenting is not who I want to be and who I want to help my child become. Right. So I'm now entering a different stage called conscious incompetence. So I'm consciously aware that what I'm doing is maybe not, like you said, not the parent that I want to be. The next stage is conscious competence. Conscious competence is when you have to think really hard about what you're doing. And, you know, so when, when my kids were young, I kid you not, I wish I had taken photos of this, but I had (laughs) sticky notes up all over my house of reminders of things that I wanted to say in certain moments. And so I had to be really conscious about moving into this competency stage of like saying the right thing, but it took a lot of effort. It took a lot of reviewing the night before. It took a lot of practicing sometimes in the mirror. And then if I could glance up and get that reminder, or if I had that in my back pocket, then I would be able to use that strategy and say, oh, it looks like you're feeling really frustrated (laughs) instead of like, stop screaming. (laughs) And then the next stage is unconscious competence and unconscious competence is where these things just flow. You know, they just come out of your lips. They just, you know, they're on the tip of your tongue. You don't have to think about it anymore. It becomes your language. It's really interesting when you think about this with learning a new language, right? If you don't know Japanese, but you don't ever, you're not in Japan or you don't have any Japanese communities that you're a part of, then you're unconsciously incompetent. You're, you don't know it, but it's not like, it's not bothering you that you don't know it. If you go to Japan, you're immediately consciously incompetent. <laughs> you don't know the language at all. And it's very obvious that you don't know it. And then, you know, you're trying to learn it. So you're sitting there and you're like, oh, you know, and you just get out a few words and you're just able to order, you know, a a drink, you know, or whatever. And then that's your conscious, but then you become, you know, once, if you live there for a couple of years, you will be able to walk in, order your food, order your drink, say goodbye, talk about the weather and, and at least become unconsciously competent. So that's a really interesting thing, but I like to share with parents. So I I'll tell you as a teacher, hundred percent after 15 plus years of teaching, I got to that level of unconscious competence. 
I mean, I didn't have to think about how to give instructions to kids. I didn't have to think about what to do when they were upset. It just came off the tip of my tongue after years of watching, like I said, mentors, leaders in the field after, you know, years of trying and being consciously competent. (laughs) It was totally natural for me. And I'll tell you where I went back to the day my son became a toddler. I didn't go back to conscious competence. I went all the way back to conscious incompetence. But Mm. like you said, to my credit, I never went, got, went all the way back to unconscious incompetence. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. You were aware. I was always aware that this was not the parent that I wanted to be. Right. And I think that's where most of our generation is. Uh, Now I've met the occasional parent who's like, I don't see a problem with any of this, you know, but for the most part, I think our generation is in this place of trying to do things a little bit different, trying to be a little bit more consciously competent. And so now I always tell parents like that for me, where I, and we'll have to put a visual of this because there's like a nice triangle visual of this. Uh, You'll have to put the link on your, on your site. But for me, what happens is as a parent is I, I'm almost never unconsciously competent as a parent (laughs) to this day, you know, it's mostly going back and forth between conscious incompetence and conscious competence, right? Like it takes so much effort. And I, I constantly have to to think about it. And every once in a while, I'll I'll be able to respond in the moment. But <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I think you're right though. Like we have to give ourselves credit, and that is the first stage of healing and breaking cycles. Is just saying maybe I don't want to do this the same. Yeah, yeah. There's no need to beat yourself up. Give yourself a pat on the back for at least and noticing and being aware and acknowledging and seeking totally. out alternatives. Like that's a very positive. positive absolutely. Thing. Absolutely. 100%. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. And some of the stuff we talked about in the second time moms group too. So the first time mom groups and second time mom groups are some pretty big differences. I know for me, I remember, you know, it, just at first when I had kids, I didn't have as many mom friends and I no. was sort of seeking out female peers to just uh, share my experience with even and, and also like do things in the real world, like go on walks together in the neighborhood or Yes. Um, you know, break out of some moments that might have felt isolated otherwise. But I'd love to hear kind of your perspective as a seasoned facilitator of these parenting groups for for moms and everyone who identifies as a mom. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think, like you said, I think becoming a parent can be really isolating. Um, it's a huge transition mm-hmm. and it's an identity shift, right? And a lot of times, you know, whether it's your first time or your second time or third time becoming a parent, your your known friends, the friends that you have before that are not usually going through that transition. You may be super lucky and have a best friend that gets pregnant at the same time as you, but that's really rare, right? (laughs) Most, I know for me, I was definitely the youngest of my friend group to have children. And so I didn't know anybody that had kids, except, you know, the kids that I taught and the parents that I knew that way. But I didn't have any friends that had children. And so and it was also I think the other identity shift. I mean, I had always worked full time. I mean, even in college, I worked. Right. And then as soon as I got out of college, I worked full time and I, you know, I started teaching and I, you know, I taught in Prague and then I came back and I taught and I went to grad school and I was working, you know, like. I didn't have an unstructured day. I don't do super well with unstructured time. (laughs) It was kind of paralyzing. And so for me, one of the things that the moms group and what I did when, um, when my son was born was that I had three different groups that I went to and I went to like one on Monday and then one on Wednesday and one on Friday and went to these different groups and they kind of created a little bit of structure in my, Mm -hmm. in my day and a little bit of, or in the week and something I could look forward to and something that, you know, and then from there I would meet people and and maybe plan something for the Tuesday and Thursday. I had to have a plan for every day. That was just me. I'm not a super planner. It's not that I'm like super type A and planny necessarily, but it's more like that unstructured time was so new to me. I'd never Mm. had it before. I was actually an athlete in college as well. So like, I didn't like, I was always like, I came home from practice. I was like, wow, you guys watch TV? Like, what is that? (laughs) Like, I had no idea, right? Um, So I think unstructured time was so new and so scary to me that that was, so that was number one, was just like creating a little bit of structure Mm -hmm. um, during that identity shift. And then 
second, here's the, I think the beautiful thing about mom's groups is that you are going through something together at the same time. And Mm -hmm. there is a level of vulnerability that can happen that I don't think happens in very other places in your life. Um, where you're actually, you're going through a very similar experience that is life transformational experience, right? Um, that is life all identity changing, like all of these things. And you're going through it with other women who are going through it as well. And I think that is so powerful and allows for this thing we call vulnerability, where you are more open, you're more you have to, you share because you have to share, right? Because like you have these things that are deep on your mind and your heart. And, and it's like, when you start a new job, let's say like, you're not like your whole identity isn't shifting. You're not like, you know, tortured by (laughs) thoughts that you never had before. You're not like, you know, so anyway, I think there's, there are a couple moments in life. I mean, I think going away to college is one of the other ones, right? Where, all of a sudden, everybody's living away from home at the same time, right? Everybody's away from their families at the same time. Everybody's starting off on this thing we call adulthood at the same time. And there are very few other opportunities. And so I really encourage your listeners to get involved in a new mom group or a second time moms group, because there are a few opportunities where you will really be in a place of going through something with other people for the first time together. Mm-hmm. And I'll say like the moms I met in my first time moms group, we're still friends. You know, we have 14 year olds. We just went out last week. <laughs> um, <Aww. laughs> and I have, I have other friends, you know, that I've met since, you know, moving to San Francisco in different, different ways. But like those friends, there is something and I, I there's something about those friendships. And I really believe that they began with vulnerability. They began with openness. They began with truth. They began with like a little bit of suffering, right? Like all of those things that really forge connections. We become very guarded as adults, right? And it's one of those rare opportunities where you let your guard down and you open up to people because you have to, (laughs) you need that, right? And you, and other people are opening up to you. And so it becomes this like, this really forged connections. So yeah, so I think I really encourage you to, like I said, not miss this opportunity where one of these major life transitions that you could do with other people, like how amazing is that just to do a major life trend? We do so many major life transitions, you know, like moving or, or starting a new job, like all those are so kind of on our own, right? And so this opportunity to do a major life transition within a community, it's a, it's a beautiful opportunity. I have lifelong friends as well from my groups that I've been a part of. They're so wonderful. They're so encouraging. We have a WhatsApp group where we're sharing pictures and staying in touch. And then, uh, you know, occasionally we'll get together in real life too, which is really lovely. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, it's just such a wonderful support uh, to have with the good and the bad. And it is, as you're kind of hinting at, it's this real leveling of the playing field for everyone. Hey, fellow parents, can we take a moment to reflect on the joyous chaos that is parenthood? You know those days when our hearts swell with love at the sight of our little ones and we're bursting at the seams to share every adorable moment with the world. But let's be real. Some things are better kept in the family, and your loved ones who matter the most aren't always close by, and they might not be that tech savvy either. So how can you easily share your baby's beautiful growth with loved ones while keeping your precious memories secure? I remember the frustration of trying to use some of the big tech photo solutions, only to find they fell short of what I needed. That's when I stumbled upon something truly remarkable, the Family Album Map. The Family Album Map was created to give parents a secure and easy way to share photos and videos with loved ones. It's an orderly and totally secure haven for your family's personal memories. I love that there's no third-party ads, no unwanted eyes, unlimited storage, and that it's totally free. So to all the parents who are out there still trying to use other messaging apps for your kids' photos, it's time to level up your family photo game with a free photo sharing app. Head over to the App Store today, search Family Album, one word, Download the app and start creating a legacy of love one photo at a time. I really liked uh, something that we talked about before, you know, when we were prepping for the show was this concept of like, you know, everyone comes in as an equal and we really focus on what we have in common and we don't really 
you know, like I don't even need to know what anyone does for a living or we don't yes. even talk about that. We don't even yes. talk, like, it's just, we're all going through the same thing at the same time. And that's the connection that that's the connective. Yes, yeah. that's yeah. And thank you. So the very first second time mom group that I ever led, I had everyone start by introducing themselves and I asked them to share, you know, about a little bit about themselves, maybe what they did, you know, for a mm-hmm. living, da, da, da. And so everybody went around and said what they did for a living or if they were working, if they weren't. And immediately I realized that was the wrong move. <laughs> <laughs> and so ever since that group, I never asked that question. I never asked that question. And, you know, what happens is, you know, as humans, right, right, we create patterns. So it's like, oh, okay, there's another techie. Oh, okay, there's another teacher. Oh, okay, there's another, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, entrepreneur. And you create those kinds of connections. But the beauty of this period in our lives is that we are all connecting on something fundamental about something about becoming a parent, right? Becoming or becoming a second time parent. And there is so much connection in that, that all of those other things like just don't even matter. And, and everyone can kind of, like you said, it's very equalizing in that, you know, it doesn't matter if you're like the CEO of like some company, or (laughs) if you're a stay at home mom, like you are completely overwhelmed by the fact that your newborn isn't sleeping. It doesn't matter what you're, you know, like everybody is having that same experience of being overwhelmed by certain things. You know, everyone in a second time mom's group is overwhelmed by the fact that their toddlers are running around like crazy animals while they're trying to breastfeed. (laughs) Everyone's having that experience. And so it is immediately connecting. But there are a couple other things that I've found can really help to facilitate those connections too. And we can, we can certainly talk about those. Yeah. Tell me what comes to mind for that. When I start, so I started the second time moms. That was the first, those were the first groups. I started those before the first time moms. And the reason I started the second time moms was, and I had already had early childhood matters and we were focusing on those toddler uh, workshops and like parenting your toddler. And, and maybe even I had started the parenting your preschooler workshops. And I had a mom who had taken like a bunch of my classes and, and she was like, have you ever thought about doing a second time mom's group? Because I'm about to have my second and Mm. I feel like I won't be able to go to first time mom's group because they'll be talking about really different things. And I was like, oh my gosh, I was literally six months postpartum with my second when she asked me that. And it had just been like the loneliest time of my life. (laughs) Because during that first, like I said, with the first, I had gone to like three groups, you know, and I had all these friends. And then I had all these mom friends then. And so I thought I didn't need to make more friends, first of all. And I did try to go to one. And I just felt like, you know, the questions were very different. It is a different stage, right? Like we talked about, you're, you're going through that transformation to motherhood together. And if you're a second time mom, you're not going through that. So it just, it doesn't quite resonate to be there was my perspective and the perspective of hundreds and hundreds of moms that have taken my second time mom's group since. (laughs) But anyway, she said, so it was her idea. She was like, would you ever think about doing a second time mom's group? And I was like, that is an amazing idea because I'm so, I've been so lonely because every time I meet with my, I have all these mom friends now, but most of them either, don't have a second yet, or they had their second a year ago and they're back at work or whatever it is. And so I just, I had the mom friends, but I still didn't have a community that was going through this trans, this life transition with me. And so, yeah, so I love the idea, but when I, when I started the groups, one thing that was really important to me was that I wanted to model it on the groups, actually the group that I had met my core people in. And I I found it really interesting. I had gone to one group that was sort of like an expert, a sage on the stage kind of group. Um, And it was wonderful. It was like, you went, you asked all your questions about like lactation, or you asked questions about, you know, sleep, or you asked questions about this or that. But basically we were all there and we asked the, the facilitator a bunch of questions and she answered all the questions. And I think I, if I hadn't had that experience, I may have um, unknowingly kind of created 
a group around that model um, accidentally, just because like I, I am kind of an expert with a toddler thing. I had just gone through the transition, right? Like I could talk for hours about like how to handle meltdowns and what other strategies to give your two-year-old when they want to squeeze the baby. Like I could have talked and talked and talked yeah. about all of that. But what I, my experience was in going to those, because I, because I was a, a, a little stopper <laughs> for my groups, my experience was that the group that was the most powerful, where I made the deepest connections to the other women, was the one where the facilitators were more like, you know, maybe MFT backgrounds, or, you know, sometimes they were, yeah. sometimes they would be a lactation consultant, but they were, they were actually like Kaiser groups. And their facilitation style was to have everybody go around and share a high and a low. And sometimes that that took up the whole session, believe it or not. And some people were like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. Like, but it was amazing because basically all you did was hear, oh my God, over and over you heard, oh my gosh, that mom is feeling that way too. Oh my gosh, that mom is feeling that way too. Oh, that mom is feeling that way, right? And like with, you know, those were bigger groups. Our groups are pretty small, like eight to 10 max. But with the bigger group, it was interesting because you had like, then you had 20 different people sharing. And and as a mom, you know that you've had all 20 of those feelings, all 20 of those lows sometime that week, right? (laughs) No matter which one you chose to speak of, you had basically had all 20 of those lows. And then you had probably all 20 of those highs as well. And again, it allowed for that vulnerability, allowed for that sharing of the experience. And so that's kind of how I I tried to structure the group. And I I created a little bit of balance where we did, we'll do like, you know, probably the first half is that sharing of just like highs and lows. And then the second half, we'll do a topic. And I find that to be a really good balance. And so hopefully when my book comes out, which is going to be called (laughs) When Baby Makes Four or More, it will actually create, the, the idea is because I you know, like I said, I've been facilitating these groups for so long and I would just love like all of your listeners who don't live in San Francisco, for example, to have the opportunity to create these kinds of groups wherever they are. So the the idea with the book is that it's actually a guide for discussion topics. And so we do the highs and lows, and then we have a topic each week with an article. And so with that, like we can actually then talk about a specific thing. It's usually either self care, self compassion. It's you know relationships with our partners. It's bonding with the new baby. It's you know how are we feeling? Um, you know mental health check in. It's you know and then if it's a second time mom group, it's like the sibling dynamic and how that's going and what are some strategies and what are some ideas and tools. So, but having that balance, I think has been really nice for our groups to have that vulnerability piece, that openness piece, that knowing other people are going through the same thing and then having a little bit of sharing also. But again, even with that section, I try to not, I mean, the the sibling ones are probably the hardest ones for me to not like give a lot of ideas on <laughs> just because like that's that's my background right like working with toddlers but for the most part with all the topics i really try to again like how how is the group feeling about you know how are things going with your partner how are things like what what works for you to stay connected in this time what's really tricky for you and again just having like i actually had a mom once share when we were talking about relationships that she found it so comforting to know that other people were having a hard time in their relationships right now too. And that's the kind of stuff that you just can't find online. Like you can't vibe that online, right? Like you can read an article or a blog or whatever about like how tricky it is, but like, like, is that isolated? Is that, de- but like to have other women share like, oh no, this is a really tricky time in our marriage. And like, you're, you actually have a relationship with those other people. And you're like, oh, these are like people that I really, I value and I trust. And I've like, you know, really um, appreciate and admire sometimes. And they're having a hard time in their marriage after their second baby was born or after their first, you know, like those kinds of things I think are, those moments where, you know, A, the vulnerability, but but you just feel not alone. And it's safe to share that kind of information with other people and be that vulnerable in a way because they are 
not necessarily your next door neighbor or your best friend from college or people you who you have these other connections oh, with. Yeah. They're like this fresh group of people That's, who you create yes. like trust with yes. in this moment. And you you may or may not have overlapping communities outside of that group. Yeah. Oh, that's a really good point too. Yeah. Yeah. I found that that's really opening for people. And also being in that raw moment of parenthood with an infant at home. I mean, most people are just kind of cracked wide open generally, emotionally yeah, and physically, exactly. uh, mentally, all those things. So it's just so much to go through and having a group to share that with has been so brilliant. And I love that your book is going to help create a framework for people to create these themselves because not everyone lives in a city or a place that has groups available to them. Obviously, if you're in the Bay Area, I highly recommend Rebecca's, which is Yay. Early Childhood Matters, and we'll link to that. And she's given us a discount code, yes. too, that you can use. It's fourth, so go sign up if you want to do that um, in the Bay Area. You know, anything that she has online, she's got tons of online content there. So that's global for everyone. There are also online groups. I mean, we're talking about what you're what you're talking about are facilitated groups that are focused and really kind of touch on the the big themes that you know are important and relevant from having done this for decades. So I love that. There are online groups. Are there online groups that you like and appreciate? Yeah. So I am not as much so I know Famfully actually is just starting to do some of those online groups as well. So that could be something else to check out. But yeah, I I know like looking at Facebook groups in your area, like local Facebook groups here in the Bay Area, we have like Main Street Mamas or we have the Golden Gate Mothers group, but those can be good places to start for sure. But I will say like, look for a facilitated group. I know that there are often mm. a lot of like free meetups, so, you know, and I, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm biased here probably, but I, I will say, I think that there is a difference with a facilitated group, or if you start your own group, you know, using like actually agreeing to some guidelines. And I would say, you know, you can use my book once it comes out, but before it comes out, <laughs> just having some basic guidelines, like, okay, so we're going to start with highs and lows. I, I tell you it's transformational to start with highs and lows, because here's what happens if you don't go around one at a time and do highs and lows. People start chatting about different things and you end up talking about like what bottles you're using and what diapers you're using and what sleep sacks you're using. And all of those things are helpful, right? And those are the kinds of things I think you can get from a meetup. But to have a facilitated group or to have some intentionality around a group that you do start in your own community, it's another level of sharing when you you do that. Because otherwise, like I said, the conversation will quickly just kind of stay at yeah, just like a more, you know, casual level, right? Like we're humans, we're not gonna just like, you know, I mean, occasionally you might open up unprompted. But I think that's what I've seen is that we end up talking about we end up talking about the weather, right? To, to quote the English. So to go deeper, I really recommend if you are starting your own group, just have the, I mean, just do that one thing. And that that mm -hmm. would probably be transformational right there. Just start with everybody getting, and, and the other thing I love about doing that is that as moms, we do a lot of listening, right? Like we're constantly listening to others all day. And so just, to, I always tell the moms, like you have a moment where everybody's just going to listen to you and it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, we're not going to try to solve your problem. We're not going to necessarily jump in and give you advice. In fact, I rarely comment after someone shares a high and a low in that way like it's very easy to do on your own like you don't you don't need a an mft to do that but you do need some agreements around that that something you know and when you put out the group like you know when you put it out on your local facebook group or whatever neighborhood group tell people that you are creating a group with some level of intentionality around sharing and the joys and the challenges and you want it to go a little deeper than a meetup and so state that as your intention and then you will draw people in that are actually interested in that level of connection. Because some people may not be, but when you create that as an attention, and, and I think that's a nice thing about our groups is that, you know, you kind of know what you're signing up for, right? Like, you know mm. that you're signing up for that level of sort of intentionality. 
and so it, it does draw in um, people that are interested in that. And, uh, and sometimes people that don't, you know, maybe wouldn't be, but once they get there, they're like, oh, this is exactly what I needed. But I think, yeah, I definitely would recommend that. And I, to me, that's a big difference between a facilitated group and a meetup. And so if you can find a facilitated group or if you can't, you know, trying to bring some intentionality to a group that you're starting, I think it makes a big difference. Yeah, that was definitely a draw for part of the reason I joined Second Time Moms is I wanted that deeper connection and to talk about more than, as you say, the weather, but you know, yeah. that like there are plenty of meetups out there. So I love this. Anyone who's listening, you can use what Rebecca just said as a guide for creating your own group out there and, you know, be like Rebecca. You don't have to just join one. You can have your online groups, your real life groups, yeah. your multiple groups. You can just yeah. go for it if you have the time and energy to do so. And so long as it's serving you well to do that. Yeah. There's so many cool things. I'll, I will give a shout out to La Leche League. They have support oh, yeah. groups out there that are specific to breastfeeding. So if that's yes. a big oh, topic you. for you. Yeah. If that's a big topic, you can go to groups that have like a specific focus like that. I don't know if you've heard of Parents Helping Parents. That's another oh, yeah, good yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Do they have online groups as well? Yeah, you can find okay, online cool. groups or like have them. And in fact, they're like facilitated online groups that are volunteer facilitators, which is really oh, cool. cool. Okay. Yes. And then there's also Mocha Moms, okay. which is described as a community for mothers of color, which are both local and online cool. and they're a nonprofit. So that's another cool one to give a shout out to. So, yeah, um, awesome. and then I, I have to mention Parenthoods. Parenthoods is an online app that's really good. It was founded by Jenny Diaz, who's been on the show back on episode nine, if you want to nice. go listen to that one. So there's just a lot of stuff out there. There's paid and there's unpaid. Yeah. I certainly am happy to pay good money for facilitated professionals who are well experienced and have the credentials to help lead these groups. I'm more than happy to do that. I think there's plenty that's free out there. I'm a big fan of just those free services too. So yeah. I don't think that you have to pay money. Like if you don't want to, or you can't, you do not have to pay money to get access to support from peers. Definitely. Definitely. And I think, mm -hmm. um, yeah, trying to, to reach out and to build those connections is, is most important. And also talk to like, I will always do sliding scale for people. So I'll like, also don't necessarily let cost be a barrier. And a lot of the hospitals that we'll do for in-person, a lot of the hospitals have like um, centering groups or like they said, that's what I did the Kaiser group. And so look at your local hospital and see if they have a group. Those are good options that are usually free or covered by your insurance. So those are, those are good options. But yeah, if, I would just encourage you to like, just to understand the difference between a facilitated group and a meetup and the, the level of vulnerability can sometimes be richer and more meaningful if you do have the opportunity to do more of a, a group versus a meetup. I love that advice. Thank you. Thank you. Well, as we come to a close here, I just want to mention again that there is a code you can use called FOURTH, F-O-U-R-T-H, if you want to sign up for Early Childhood Matters and get a 20% discount for any of the online programs and classes and meetups. And so check that out. And then also, Rebecca, I just want to take this opportunity to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for this time and this conversation mm -hmm. and for everything you're doing for parents. Oh, thank you. I'm I'm so excited about your podcast. And I think it's it is a wonderful and free resource for parents to get support to get ideas to get strategies to get some experts in different areas just giving support. It's such a critical period in our lives as as mothers and and for our children. And so to have a resource like this is so amazing. So thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you, Rebecca. You can subscribe to this podcast in order to hear more from us. Thank you for listening, everyone. And I hope you'll join us next time on the fourth trimester. The theme music on this podcast was created by Sean Trott. Hear more at soundcloud.com slash Sean Trott. Special thanks to my true loves, my husband, Ben, daughter, Penelope, and baby girl, Evelyn. Don't forget to share the fourth trimester podcast with any new and expecting parents. I'm Sarah Trott. Goodbye for now. Hello again, bicycle man I know you're doing all that you can I wrote this song, simple and true I wrote
the song I'll sing a song for you You got your wheels You got your gears You ride around town with any fear You got your pedals You got your brakes You always wear your helmet For safety's sake Hello again, bicycle man I know you're doing all that you can I wrote the song, simple and true I wrote the song, I sing a song for you Hello again, bicycle man I know you're doing the best that you can I wrote the song, simple and true I wrote the song, I sing a song for you